Hey folks, Steve here with a very special unboxing video for you today. Uh, you probably won't watch this until Friday, but um, I got my GMT game shipment uh, for this month or, you know, for whenever they send out the games. And I got three games, so I'm going to have three unboxing videos today, but it made sense to start with 1918-1919 Storm in the West. Um, and... I, I've been tracking this game for a long time, um, from back when, uh, well, I guess this edition, anyway, from back when it was in danger of not being reprinted, not being done in this edition by GMT because it didn't have enough pre-orders, to trying to rally support to get it made, and, and it's just sort of squeaking by, uh, getting enough orders to justify the production. Um, and not too long ago, we got a look at the rules PDF, and we looked over that. But I got the game. It's here in my hands. Um, awesome. <laughs> like over a year ago, we were waiting around, hoping this game would actually get uh, published as this new edition. Um, and here it is. So 1918, uh, Storm in the West was a magazine game uh, from some time back. Um, and is now being reprinted by GMT, along with a 1919 scenario or Plan 1919 campaign. Uh, which, interestingly, they kind of mark uh, down here a complete second game included. So there's particular counters for the 1919 game or scenario in here. Um, whether or not it counts as a totally complete different game, I don't know. It's it, you know, it uses a different map, and we'll look at that. Now, I've already taken the shrink off just because I was having trouble like getting an edge in so I could rip off the shrink, and I ended up just ripping all the shrink off. But I've not lifted the lid, so... Yeah. Forgive me, I've removed the shrink before I started recording. Um, but we'll take a look at uh, unboxing of this guy, and as I had promised in the past, um, we will probably very shortly get right into uh, some coverage of this game and a recorded playthrough of the base 1918 Storm in the West scenario. At least that's my plan. I've got to punch the counters. I, I'm going to clip the counters probably and get into all of that. So uh, let's take a look here. So uh, uh, some... Uh, World War One art on the front. The the game box. Um, I do kind of like it's got the sort of yellow, black, white overall color scheme, um, and is it feels appropriate, I guess, for the for the conflict. Um, I do find it interesting. It's called you know Ted Racer's World War One Strategic Game. I don't know that I would call this a strategic game. Um, to me, this is really more of an operational game. So I. I'm not sure what all the thinking is behind that. Maybe this is purely marketing. I don't know. Um, but there, you, but there you go. Now this is a standard size box. You can see uh, the box quality is uh, pretty solid and standard. It's not flimsy. It's nice and, and solid stuff here. Uh, as I flip onto the back, you can see a picture of the 1918 map. And this is why I say, you know, this is more operational to me than. Uh, strategic, so it, you know you're only seeing the Western Front and really specifically, you know this aspect of the Western Front with Belgium and France and, and Germany and all of that. Um, and this map is, in terms of scope and size, uh, similar to some of the other maps that uh, Ted Racer has done for this theater um, for World War One. So games like. Uh, uh, Clash of Giants or uh, 1914 Glory's End will have very similar uh, maps to this, but this being the 1918 version of the map, you know, the trench lines are, are well defined there. You can kind of see cool. that. And uh, the counters you get a little preview of here on the back. They all kind of look straightforward to what you would expect. And there's your blurb there. You can read that. Um, I, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time looking at that. Uh, you can see we're going to have, we should have a back printed map, one full size sheet of counters, a half size sheet of counters, two player aid cards, a rules booklet, and uh, two six sided dice. Time scale is half a month per turn, eight miles per hex, division and core. Game complexity is a medium. Uh, solitaire suitability is pretty high. So this is going to be oh, interesting. They actually put a time. On here, some games don't, and you're really like you have to look it up on Board Game Geek. How long does it take to play? This says four hours. So interesting. Um, yeah, so there you go. the The back 
all straightforward. I would agree the game seems to me to be in around that medium or lower complexity. Solitaire suitability, I mean, I guess that makes sense. There's really not much in the way of hidden information in this game based on my rules. Really. So let's take the lid off and take a look at what's inside. And there is our rules of play, uh, which we've seen in PDF form already. Um, Two-column format, color, uh, non-glossy paper. Now, I've already found that there are some slight bits of errata uh, available online. Don't let that scare you. It is very, very minor. Uh, very, very minor. I will doodle that in with a pencil, probably, in mine. It's like, you know, a couple words are off, you know. Um, nothing dramatic, nothing that would really disrupt your ability to play the game. Um, so, no, no worries there. There could be more errata to come, but as of today, uh, Thursday, you know, end of October, uh, you're in good shape there. So, yeah, two-column color. Uh, we reviewed the rules in a separate video. You can go watch that if you'd like uh, on the channel here, but um, and also posted a, posted a board game week, I think. Uh, I got it up there. Um, you know, straightforward stuff. The rules aren't terribly complicated. I think this is going to be, in terms of Hex Encounter, Pretty straightforward thing. It is not chit pull. So a lot of Ted Racer games are chit pull. This one is not. It's a I go, you go with the uh, central powers going first, allies going second, usually. Um, here's your second sheet, apparently. So as I look, you know, it's like these are the 1919 counters, right? So you can see the Storm in the West variant. Um, a, a higher number of armor units are contained here. Even the Germans get their uh, armor unit. Because this is a hypothetical 1919 campaign, if the war stretched to that point. There's a lot of blank counters. I, I actually like having blank counters because it means I get to use uh, use them in other games if I want. I can print out my own sort of sticker paper stuff and stick them on and have my own counters for whatever I need them for. So I'll harvest these for sure. The uh, counters appear to be the good quality brown core, even for this production. Um, and I'm really happy to to hear that. I might not even have to clip these. I might not even want to clip these, just because it'll be harsh on my clipper if there are these thick counters. Um, and then here's really the counters you're going to use the most, which are the uh, the main game, Storm in the West counters. So you have uh, Americans, you have uh, British and their allies, you have the French, one Italian unit there. You can see it's, it's predominantly infantry, and an infantry of particular type like core are going to be, m for the most part, similar combat strength across the board. There, there's a few variations. Um, you got some cavalry, you've got your armor units, uh, your German assault units, so your Staatstruppen, uh, and uh, Big Bertha, heavy, cap or heavy artillery, not heavy cavalry. Uh, some markers for air support, which is very minor, uh, and then sort of your uh, administrative counters. Really straightforward. You know, really having, you know, one and a half counter sheets of stuff. I mean, it's not going to, this isn't a super duper heavy game, um, but there's plenty still to, to, you know, have fun with here, right? Um, and again, I, I will call out the thick counters. I was expect, I was kind of, I don't know if I was worried, but I was expecting maybe the white core uh, counters that aren't as thick. These are going to punch out really easy. I, I, may not even need to clip them at all, and, and these are going to be in nice good shape. Um, I tend to clip counters if they're lower quality counters, just because the, the dog ears, the edges, the corners tend to be in rougher shape, but if the quality of the counter are, is really thick and nice, um, then it's it's not worth clipping the counter, is kind of the way I look at it. Um, then we have got the map, and I won't spend a whole lot of time with the map. Um, but as I lay it out, it is a paper map. I uh, knew that going in. And you can see, I mean, it's just like on the back of the box I just showed. Uh, there's some uh, charts. Uh, some uh, There's a turn track over here, and then there's a general records chart over here. Um, and you can kind of play around with, I guess, how much you really need those. Um, I do think that uh, the counters are going to feel awfully big in some of the hexes. I'm just, as I try to make a comparison here, um, yeah, the, the, the hexes are almost, 
too small for the hex size, or uh, the hexes are almost too small for the counter size. So it might be, you know, things are going to be a little, um, they just might end up being a little congested. Uh, but hey, I guess it's World War One. that's what you got. If I flip it around, um, you have the 1919 map. So it's very similar, you know, similar boxes and, and, and all of that. Um, I think the main differences are on here that, like, the secondary trench lines are improved and made in a deeper, uh, more resilient trench lines, and there's a few other a little bit of terrain changes, but uh, all this being hypothetical again for 1919. So straightforward there, uh, paper map. You're going to put some plexi on that, ideally. Um, well, that's, that's what I'll plan on uh, be doing. Uh, here are the two player aid charts. Now, what I find really interesting, and I, I'll, I'll set one down. I don't, they're identical. Um, there's a whole lot of space that's just not game related. It's an it's it's an interesting picture. It's you know, it's, it's cool and and appropriate for the period. Um, it it makes me wonder like did they just not need all of this space for the player aid? So they just sort of they they use some art. It makes me wonder you know maybe we'll come across some stuff that's like oh that would have been nice to put on the player aid chart and use up this space. But maybe they've gotten everything that they need. Uh, so you've got your combat results chart, should look pretty typical with DRMs, nothing too crazy there. Replacement charts, telling you how many replacements each faction gets. Uh, so the Allies kind of have split between Britain, France, and USA. Uh, some summary tables or reminders, so that's all straightforward, useful stuff. Your terrain effects chart, that governs you know what terrain has for movement cost or combat effects. Tactical bombing table, so that's interesting. Um, strategic bombing table, I think some of this has more to do with 1919. Uh, a 1919 replacement chart specific to that scenario. And, yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's not, I guess, maybe not a whole lot that you need on the player aid chart, but these seem comprehensive enough that they're going to get you um, as far as you need to go. And you got the nice period picture there to uh, make you feel the, the time, I guess. Uh, and... That appears to be it besides uh, two dice, black and white. Um, always good there. And you've got this gigantic insert. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, gi it's the biggest insert I've ever seen in terms of box space. So you've got this narrow canal of, like, to stuff stuff in. And I guess this makes sense. The map is going to be thin. The rule book is thin. The player aid charts are thin. Once you punch the counters, they're going to sit in here really easy, I, no matter which way you organize them. So you could almost look at this and say, well, it, it's almost it's almost too much box space for the game. Um, and maybe they should have done a, a box that was slimmer, like uh, Ted Racer's Reds, the Russian Civil War. That box is actually, you know, like this this thin or something like that. They could have maybe gotten away with doing that here, but I, I'm. What am I complaining about? <laughs> it's it. It works, right? So this is all good stuff. All right, guys. There we go. That's that's the game. That's the unboxed game. Um, pretty straightforward stuff. Like I said, this is a a bread and butter hex encounter uh, kind of game. We've been waiting for it for a long time. I am looking forward to punching those counters and getting them organized. Uh, for some game playing. Um, I think the really interesting thing for this one will be is sort of a closing thought before we get into the game proper. Um, eventually, uh, within the next few days, I hope, uh, I'm taking some time off work, so maybe I'll have more time to play some games. Um, you know, World War One has this funny thing where, I mean, you can play a strategic game from 1914 to 1918, uh, but if you get into the operational realm, um, you tend to be really focused on particular uh, campaign events. Um, 1914 tends to be the most popular because those are sort of seen as the decisive, you know, the war was four years long, but really had those initial campaigns ended differently, the war would have gone differently. And that's why you see the big, like, 1914 uh, games by Michael Reich with, like, their gigantic monster games just for that campaign. You've got smaller operational games, and they all tend to be 1914 with, every once in a while, a curveball. This one's really interesting because it, it, it allows you to get into that late war campaign stuff that, that sometimes gets 
uh, ignored or brushed over, and, and I think it's really neat to have a game in my collection that covers this. Again, the original version of this game is years old, so you know other folks have had access to it, but now I have it, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have it. I'm, I'm pretty stoked on uh, giving this a, a play. And it would be interesting, I guess, to play this and then maybe go back to 1914 Glory's End or Class of Giants and kind of compare how they play together, but you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. we got to play this first, right? So we'll take a look at this here uh, in some videos to come. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the unboxing video. I'm going to have a few other unboxing videos here uh, for you today, whenever you're watching this. So you can check those out. Um, and until then, uh, take care and keep on gaming.